Welcome to everyone to Talk 4 of Men's Health Week. Um, I said to my wife the, the, yesterday, I've never been this excited to interview someone since I was about 10 and uh, first met Dr. Harry Cooper when I was uh, convinced I was going to be a vet. But <laughs> I'm a physio now. And so I've just got a quick bio for, for Professor Robert Newton who's joining me today. So he's the Professor of Exercise Medicine in the Exercise Medicine Research Institute and Associate Dean of the Medical and Exercise Sciences at Edith Cowan University in Perth. Prior to his appointment there, he was the Director of Biomechanics at Ball State University in Indiana and also at the Pennsylvania State University. His current major research directions include reducing decline in strength, body composition and functional ability in cancer patients cancer-related fatigue and the influence of exercise, uh, especially the mechanisms of exercise as a medicine in suppressing cancer progression. He's an accredited exercise physiologist, certified strength and conditioning specialist with distinction, fellow of the Exercise and Sports Science Australia, and fellow of the National Strength and Conditioning Association. And the next part's huge. He's published over 800 scientific papers and his work's been cited over 19,000 times. And as of this year, his work and his team have attracted over $38 million in competitive research funding, which is just amazing. Um, and during he's also extensive track record of research consultancy um, in developing maximum strength and power, which led to him being a consultant to numerous professional teams, including the Chicago Bulls, New Jersey Nets, Indianapolis Colts, England Rugby, Manchester United, and the English and Australian Institute of Sport. And so with such a huge bio, Rob, how do you keep fit and healthy? Well, I'm, I'm almost 60, so I'm, I'm getting up there in age. So more and more time it becomes crucial that I, I try and stay as fit as I possibly can. Um, and uh, so that's important, important for me. And you, you, have to, you have to talk the talk and walk the walk. Uh, I don't think you can ever ask an athlete um, or a patient to do something uh, that you're not doing yourself. So... Um, Look, I'm right these days. I'm right into high intensity uh, interval training uh, now. So my wife and I uh, three mornings a week at 5:20 in the morning, uh, which is a little bit hard in, in winter now. Um, we're off and we do a 47 minute um, uh, high intensity workout. Got a bit of boxing in there, a bit of a uh, uh, bit of resistance training. Uh, so that's quite good. Pumping iron. Uh, swim once a week. Uh, this afternoon I'll run. I'm not much of a runner uh, these days, but I try and get a run run in a week. So I'll be doing seven k's tonight. That's about my limit these days with arthritis and dodgy knees. <laughs> but we know we know exercise is great for those things as well. So you're not going to stop. Absolutely, keeping from falling apart. <laughs> and so your early research days mostly worked around athletic popula populations and power, and you still you still are in that space. But what kind of led you down to the role of exercise as a medicine in chronic diseases? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. It's go, it would go back to 1994, uh, actually, when I went and did um, uh, a research sabbatical with William Kramer at, the university, at uh, Pennsylvania State University. And um, I was doing work on elite athletes. And, of course, Penn State's a Division, uh, division One school and uh, incredible athletes there, football in particular, basketball, but also volleyball. And I was doing research on volleyball players because I was very interested in the biomechanics of, of how they can jump um, so efficiently. And uh, I went out one night to train one of the players. Uh, it, was a, it was a Friday night and I, um, it was snowing. Uh, we had something like 300 inches of snow that year. and It was a, just a really snowy winter. And uh, I got in a little car that we bought, this really old um, uh, Chevrolet that we bought. And um, anyhow, I drove out to the arena to train this athlete. I got there and uh, he wasn't there. And I waited for about two hours. He didn't turn up. And, and yeah, I gave up and went home. And um, I got, I got, by the time I got home, the bottle of wine that we'd opened uh, Friday night to uh, have with dinner, my wife had finished um, by herself. And she said, oh, how'd it go? And I said, oh, the athlete didn't turn up. And she said, I don't know why you do this athlete work. It's meaningless. It doesn't contribute to anything. <laughs> and I look, at the time, I got a little bit upset. And I went, oh, no, I think it's important to understand human function. Um, but th that was a bit of an epiphany for me. And I, look, I still love the elite, you know, the athlete work that we do. And we still, we still have a fairly, you know, personally, I have a large program in, of research around that as well and several PhD students. It is still very, very important 
for a number of reasons, which I'll explain. Um, but it was at that point that I, I thought, no, I'm going to have a look at, at how if I can apply all of the exercise science that I've learned and start applying it to different uh, populations. And, and the first population, that, uh, which is a study I started at Penn State, was in older men. And uh, it was very much about increasing strength and power. So I took what I'd learned. My PhD previously was in um, maximizing explosiveness or ballistic power. And uh, you know, a major problem as we age, of course, is reduction in, in muscle uh, quality, uh, quantity, and you know, functional capacity, particularly around strength and power production. And I thought, you know, can I apply all I've learned in, in training, you know, elite basketball players, football, et cetera, can I apply it in, a, in, a, in older men as a starting point? And it was that point, uh, we ran a trial where we had old men, the, the average age was 72, and uh, we had them doing vertical jump with weight. Um, so they had barbells on their shoulders and, and weighted dumbbells and things, and we had them doing explosive training, which was unheard of back in 1994. Um, but we produced considerable improvements in physical function. Uh, and so that was, yeah, that was quite exciting. And, um, and that was my first foray into that. And, uh, but I didn't really get into the chronic disease area until uh, 2003 when I moved to, um, from the US, I was at uh, Indian, Indiana at the time at uh, Ball State University. And I got an opportunity of a full professorship at either Town University. And uh, not many of them floating around, professorial chairs in Australia in, in exercise and sports science. So I, I grabbed it with both hands. And, um, one of the areas that I wanted to pursue there was the application of uh, exercise as a medicine for cancer management. And that was motivated by uh, a few years earlier than that, my father passed away from prostate cancer. And, you know, whilst he received very good medical care, there was no follow up. There was no uh, rehabilitation from the surgery that he'd had, the radiation therapy that he'd had. And um, I thought, gee, when I, you know, you had this overwhelming fatigue. And the, all the doctors and nurses said, you just have to rest. You know, you've, you've had cancer, you know, it'll take a while to get it, just rest. And I knew, you know, my core as an exercise scientist, it was wrong. And uh, so what I proposed at, to ECU was to launch a program of research around applying exercise in cancer populations. Yeah, right. That's, that's fascinating. Well, that's, that's, um... I'll, I'll try it, Tom, I'll try to keep my, all my rest of my answers a little bit shorter <laughs> than that one. No, no, that, that's just like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And so that was, that was my next question was, you know, initially, yeah, exercise was thought to be of, of no benefit or, or potentially dangerous for, for cancer yeah. populations. Oh, absolutely. And, and even um, in 2003, um, when I uh, launched these ideas, uh, certainly in the lay public, the thinking was that, you know, I'm unwell, I'm sick, I need to rest and recover, I need to lie down. And, uh, you know, with, with my father, uh, you know, after his radiation therapy, it, it induces a lot of fatigue. So he's very, very tired. But it's not the fatigue that, you know, you or I feel, you know, when we've been working hard all day, mentally or physically. It's a different type of fatigue. And very much is driven by declines in physical capacity, aerobic capacity, muscle quality and, and quantity decreases in strength. And that's what drives the fatigue as well as a whole lot of immune and infl inflammatory um, processes as well. And so rest is not the answer. Uh, you have to actually rehabilitate and, and, and build the capacity of a system. But that was not well understood uh, back in 2003. And it was still, you know, if I, if I think back when I first went out and started talking to the oncologists in particular, explaining what I wanted to do, um, you know, half of them would say, look, you know, exercise is fine. It's not going to hurt the patient, but you know, it's not really going to help them. I mean, they've got cancer. Um, you know, how's exercise going to help? But there was about 50%, I would say, of oncologists who say, no, that, that, that they can't exercise. It'll make the cancer worse. It'll exacerbate it. The thinking was that if you exercise, it would increase your metabolism and, and that would feed the cancer or it would increase blood flow and that would give more nutrients and oxygen to the cancer cells and they'd they break off and metastasize more quickly. Uh, you know, we, we, we move almost 20 years later and uh, we know that all of that is false. Uh, there's not a single study which has demonstrated that uh, targeted exercise actually exacerbates cancer. And there's now literally thousands of trials, high quality, randomized controlled trials, which, um, uh, which show considerable benefit 
for cancer patients. So a huge change in thinking since uh, uh, the early 2000s. And, and what are our current recommendations for cancer patients with regards to exercise? So uh, last year, uh, my colleagues and I published the Australian Physician Statement for Exercise and Sports Science Australia on exercise medicine in cancer management. And very much the message around that was that it has to be tailored to the individual patient. Uh, we've been working uh, since 2009, 2010 uh, on a general recommendation that patients should try to complete 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous to moderate aerobic exercise and two or more resistance training sessions per week. And, and this was really based on the ACSM recommendation for healthy older adults. And this understandably caused some concern among clinicians and patients because they go, well, you know, I have cancer, I'm undergoing chemotherapy, for example, I've got a lot of uh, uh, morbidities associated with that. I mean, is this the right recommendation? That seems like a lot. And, you know, over the, the last 16 years, as we've been doing these various research trials with, with various cancer populations, uh, and at various stages, including advanced um, uh, cancer. Uh, what we've seen is that that generic recommendation simply does not work. Uh, and it may in fact cause a, an overreaching syndrome within the patient, whereby it might, uh, it hasn't been proven, um, but certainly some very nice work by uh, Dr. Lee Jones out of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. He's published some nice papers in uh, advanced breast cancer where uh, he gave, uh, you know, not an excessive amount of aerobic exercise, but certainly he observed maladaptation amongst these patients. So they were not responding well. It, it possibly exacerbated their fatigue slightly. So we now know that that recommendation, whilst it might be appropriate for a, a, a patient who's been through their treatment, uh, they have no, you know, marked... Um, uh, <laughs> ongoing toxicities or side effects of treatment and uh, you know they're, they're doing relatively well the, the generic recommendation might be okay but for, certainly for patients preparing for treatment or in treatment or those that are um, you know have, have only recently come out of surgery chemotherapy radiation therapy no it needs to be tailored considerably and the the tailoring really involves prioritizing those health issues which are causing the greatest problems for the patient, whether it be impact on quality of life or function, body composition, uh, or their actual mortality. You know, if there's a particular factor such as um, very low cardiorespiratory capacity uh, or uh, considerable cachexia, loss of body weight and particular muscle mass, you have to get a handle on that. You have to focus on that. Everything else doesn't matter because you know, if they're going to, uh, you know, if they're at risk of dying, uh, because of these particular morbidities, then that has to be the priority. And so very much we recommend a tailored approach uh, based on the, the health and physical fitness assessment of the patient, but also matching in with their, their goals and desires. Uh, you have, you know, obviously it's the patient who's in charge um, and you, you, you have to very much uh, work towards what, what their, their, um, their needs are. Yeah, great, Rob. That's like, it, it's... it's um... It's so good to hear, hear that kind of message that, you know, particularly for some clinicians that we need to kind of step out of our own shoes and go, you know, what's, what's right for this patient? And it might not be necessarily our biases if we bias towards aerobic or strength training. It might be the exact opposite. And we kind of need to think about it and go down that way. And look, sometimes you have to, you know, work with the patient and, and get them to understand priorities. I mean, some patients will go, I just like to walk. Well, you know, if the patient has, you know, uh, bone density issues, the walking is not going to do anything for them. You know, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to lift weights and you may have to do some form of impact loading to try and stem the decline in, uh, in your bone health. Um, so it is, you know, it's a process of helping them to understand uh, what the priorities are in terms of their quality and quantity of life, but also matching that with what their, their aims and goals are. Yeah. That's just that. Me, me, I don't like running, but I'm still running this afternoon. <laughs> it's just something I've got to do. <laughs> yeah, I don't like swimming, but I haven't. I can, I can counter out that by going for a run. So, 
The, um, I'm going to go into a few more specifics around exercise and cancer, and, and, and the next one, the next one's a bit of a big one, but just briefly ish. Uh, exercise induced immunotherapy. What's all that about? Okay, so the, the the big thing in cancer care at the moment is around therapeutics, is all about switching on the body's own immune system. So when we talk about immunotherapy, it is. Uh, pharmaceutical manipulations uh, of the body's internal immune system. How do we actually turn it on so it's better able to um, locate uh, and to identify cancer cells and then be able to destroy them? Uh, exercise does that very, very effectively um, in its own right because uh, when we do exercise, you know, we get a, a quite a marked change in our internal physiology and chemistry. Um, we get a whole lot of signaling proteins that are released, the cytokines, but also hormones as well, uh, which then cause the release of different immune cells, in particular uh, T cells, natural killer cells. And uh, we, we know from a very large range of studies uh, that uh, that then, if you like, upregulates your immune system and makes it smarter, better able to actually identify what is wrong, what, you know, what, what cells shouldn't be there, in other words, the cancer cells. So this has been demonstrated quite well, predominantly in preclinical studies, so in animal studies. It's difficult to show this in, in human studies. Uh, certainly, the, uh, in human studies, it's been well demonstrated the immune um, function benefits of exercise, but not the direct connection between that and uh, actual cancer suppression. That's mainly been shown in, in animal studies quite effectively, uh, but also in in vitro studies where um, human um, serum, so blood, extract the serum, pouring it over different cell lines, we see a massive suppression of, um, of, of uh, cancer cell growth. That's, um, that, that study is one of my favourite studies, the one where they took the, the high intensity bout of exercise and then got the 31% decrease in, in cell activity. Oh, that's, it's it, it, I mean, it is. I mean, that was, that was the, the landmark study which said, well, hang on, Something is released when we exercise, uh, which has a strong anti-cancer effect uh, and somehow signals to the cancer cells to, to, you know, to shut down and to, to not proliferate. Uh, and uh, that was shown in, in uh, healthy men uh, in that particular study. We now have one of our PhD students uh, doing a similar study, but he is uh, actually involving men with prostate cancer. And so uh, looking at see whether the same effect, again, men with prostate cancer, drawing blood pre and post an acute exercise bout, and then putting it over uh, cancer cell lines in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in vitro to see if we get the same uh, suppression effect. And with, with exercise, so we know a regular bout of exercise will get, uh, it helps with the regulation of our blood glucose levels. How, how important is that with regard to cancerous tumours? So for, for many of the key uh, cancers, in, in particular, you know, your breast cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, uh, it's a major problem in uh, patients who have type 2 diabetes, uh, patients who um, are glucose intolerant. And, and the reason why is that um, their, their glucose, their blood glucose level is a high, higher than what is healthy. And... Uh, Tumor cells are anaerobic, and so uh, they love glucose, and uh, they they don't really use fat for it for energy. And so, having a high uh, glucose level is uh, promotional for the tumor cell growth. Um, but also, insulin is promotive as well. Um, I mean, insulin obviously has a very very important function in the body, uh, but if it's elevated chronically for many types of cancer cell, it actually encourages growth. And then following on from that to a degree, we also know when we exercise, we get angiogenesis, so an increase, improvement in the, in, the, in the vascular system, so more blood vessels to allow better blood flow throughout the body. How, how does that affect um, cancer to a degree and how, how is that helpful? Well, that's an interesting one because the thinking was uh, that uh, we should actually starve the tumour of blood. And so there was many um, pharmaceutical interventions developed which actually interfered with the development of the, uh, of the blood supply to the tumour and thinking that if we starved it of oxygen and nutrients, it would grow more slowly. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, uh, cancer cells 
as I said, they, they prefer a hypoxic environment. They're anaerobic in terms of their energy um, source, and they actually thrive in a hypoxic environment, uh, whereas uh, healthy cells don't do as well. So it causes the cancer to tend to overtake. The other thing is that uh, if it is a hypoxic environment where you've got poor blood flow through the tumour, um, it also causes disruption to the cell, to the um, capillary walls. So the, the actual um, uh, circulation uh, is poor, it's leaky, um, and this encourages uh, tumour cells to actually leak out of the tissue and into the blood supply. So it's well shown that the risk of metastasis is much higher in tumours that have poor blood circulation and are hypoxic. Uh, so there's been some very nice work done showing, uh, once again, in animal models, that uh, if you exercise the animal, that the microcirculation within the tumour is much more organised and more normal. And that we, we see suppresses rate of growth, uh, potentially because with better circulation, you're delivering more chemotherapy agent, you're delivering more of the body's uh, innate immune system, so more natural killer cells, etc. cetera. Um, and so uh, also acutely when we exercise, it's interesting, as you know, uh, when we exercise, a lot of the tissues of the body reduce their blood flow. We have uh, vasoconstriction to provide as much blood as possible to the working muscles. In uh, tumour tissue, that doesn't occur. The vasoconstriction is suppressed. And so they stay open. When we exercise, blood pressure goes up. So blood perfusion and flow through the tumour is much, much higher. So that's important in particular for the delivery of chemotherapy and also uh, the oxygen enhancement effect of radiation therapy. So radiation therapy is not as effective in tumours that have poor blood flow. So again, we have uh, a trial uh, which we're running where we're exercising the patient immediately before they commence their radiation therapy uh, to uh, increase blood flow and oxygenation in the actual tumour. So when it's irradiated, you'll get a higher um, rate of cell death. Yeah, right. And I, I wasn't aware of that one. That's that's huge. Like I, I knew I, I knew around the chemo side of things, but radiation as well. That's pretty massive. Yeah, it's a very exciting aspect to it because you know it's 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 very well established, and I don't think anyone would argue that exercise improves quality of life. And for the patient, quality of life is number one, obviously. Um, and even for the clinician, that's where their focus is. But what we're seeing more and more now is, is exercise used as an actual enhancement for the primary treatments. Um, so in particular, chemotherapy and radiation is important uh, that the patient remains active during that phase because it may actually make the treatment, the primary treatment, actually more effective, whilst also reducing the side effects and toxicities of the treatment. Yeah. And... Um... While we're talking about different different treatments for uh, for prostate cancer, for example, uh, for men undergoing a prostatectomy, so removal of the prostate, uh, what role does aerobic and resistance training play in, in helping to reduce incontinence and erectile dysfunction post surgery? Okay, um, gee, how long have you got? <laughs> um, <laughs> look, there's a, there's so many reasons why. Uh, Exercise as a neoadjuvant treatment is so important around surgery. So neoadjuvant means it's a, a treatment which is done before the primary treatment, in this case surgery, to make it more successful. And you know, there's there's all of the pre-surgical issues as well. I mean, obviously, a patient going for any form of surgery it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be cancer, but any form of surgery, a patient going in with better aerobic and musculoskeletal fitness is going to do better. Um, they'll do better under, under anaesthetic, they'll recover faster, they'll have a less infection risk and, and less time in hospital. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's pretty well established now. In terms of um, the, the using it leading up to surgery, um, there's many applications. We've just got a paper about to go out where we looked at very rapid weight loss um, prior to surgery. Unfortunately, in Australia, two-thirds of men are overweight or obese. This is a problem in terms of prostatectomy. It's harder for the surgeon to do the surgery, uh, obviously. Uh, the patient is chronically inflamed. Uh, they're at higher risk of surgical complications, post-surgical infection, et cetera. And so uh, we've just completed a study. And as I say, we've, we've written the paper up. 
um, where we looked at a very rapid weight loss in the eight to 10 weeks leading up to the prostatectomy. And uh, very good success with that in terms of, of fat loss um, with that. So there's that, that aspect to it as well. And if the surgery is less complex and is easier, you'll have better nerve sparing, uh, there's less likelihood that you're going to have uh, erectile dysfunction and uh, incontinence. Uh, but also I think, you know, obviously strengthening the muscles prior to this insult of surgery, uh, pelvic floor exercises, but also we're looking at strengthening all of the muscles around the pelvic region, in particular your very large muscles like your gluteals. Um, very important that they, you know, they're of really high strength and, and high mass um, before the surgery because they, they're, they're going to decline as a result of surgery. And um, so we work very hard on that. And then uh, post-surgery again, uh, I think we spend a lot of time on pelvic floor exercise, which is important. It's shown very good efficacy, but we forget all the larger muscles in that area as well, which are also very, very important, not the least because they're going to be producing more of these cytokines, which help with repair, um, obviously doing whole body, large muscle group exercise, you get an increase in, in testosterone if the man's not on testosterone suppression, but injuries, increasing growth hormone and all these other positive hormones uh, and the cytokines as well, which will all help to facilitate that repair in the pelvic region. I, I completely agree with, uh, with, with all that. So I think it's um, the more the man moves, the more the pelvic floor is naturally engaged as well, but also you know, the stronger all the other muscles are, the more they can help offload the pelvic floor when they go to move as well. And, uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. And then coming back to the, uh, the fat loss, you know, I was fortunate enough to watch a surgery, a prostatectomy a few years ago, and, and it's amazing, like, to see inside an abdomen and you can see these fat cells and that just create their own blood supply and, and the blood loss during a surgery of someone who, who is overweight compared to someone who... Who isn't? It's 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 insane. Like it's incredible how much more how much harder that operation is for a urologist to do. Uh, it is, and the, you know the the surgeons report to us that in these overweight patients that everything's inflamed, um, it's everything's adhering the tissues, etc. And um, uh, you know, it just makes the surgery more difficult. So it, you know the outcomes are, are not going to be as favourable. So yeah, a major target now, and and, and with prostatectomy in general, there's no great rush. To, to get in there, um, you know, we're seeing an eight to 10 week um, period there. It's ideal to get the patient's fat mass down, muscle mass up and try and get their fitness up as quickly as we can. Yeah. And uh, what about more advanced cancers? So patients that may have a bit of a bony metastasis, et cetera, like should they still be exercising and is it safe for them to, to exercise as well? Again, Tom, it comes back to this uh, highly tailored prescription, and that's why one size doesn't fit all. So the, um, the original recommendations that look, we put it in our 2009 position statement for ESSA, um, we put it in this idea of 150 minutes of aerobic exercise and two or more resistance training sessions per week. Um, but certainly even more so in patients with advanced cancer, it has to be highly tailored, in particular if they've got bone metastases. So, we were the first group in the world to run an exercise uh, resistance training study in patients with bony metastases. And what we did with that study was we exercised all the bits that weren't affected. And we, again, we, we're just borrowing on this enormous volume of knowledge and research around um, high performance um, sport and athlete performance. What we've learned about astronaut um, survival, what we've learned about warfighters, soldiers, and you know, how do you increase their performance and keep them alive? So, all of that body of work, which is enormous, now we're actually applying it in the clinical medical um, um, environment. And, uh, you know, if, a, if a, well, we don't have any sport on at the moment, it's all cancelled, but oh, some of it's coming back. But, you know, but with no crowds. Um, but, you know, if, if one of the West Coast Eagles gets, you know, injured on Saturday, you know, the coach doesn't say, well, that's a shame, why don't you have six weeks off? It just doesn't happen. You know, they're in the next day. And we just exercise all the, all the parts of the body that aren't injured. And so we applied this with the, with the patient. So if they have a bony metastasis in their uh, right uh, humerus, for example, then we just exercise the other arm. And uh, 
So that was our philosophy. However, there's been some very interesting research, animal work again, showing that if there's controlled loading on the bone, it actually suppresses the uh, progression of the bony metastasis. Um, and it's probably some local signaling there. As you know, bones are very active tissue. Uh, when you put force through it, you get all sorts of chemical and electrical messaging going between the various bone cells. And it appears that that is also signaling to the tumor cells and actually shutting them down. So uh, we've completed two studies now, one in advanced prostate cancer and one in advanced breast cancer, where we've actually uh, patients with uh, bone metastasis in their spine and we've been using isometric contractions to place a controlled amount of loading on the, uh, on the bony site. We've had no exacerbations of bone pain with that. It appears to be safe in that very well controlled monitored environment. Uh, so I think in the future we'll see uh, quite tailored exercise prescriptions uh, passing some amount of load through the actual site of the bony metastases, but it might be a while before it moves from the research trial into actual clinical practice and recommendation. Yeah. The, um, before you touched on, on the initial trials and, and oncologists that were for it and ones that were flat out against it, in terms of, of exercise and, and medicine for, for people, you know, uh, prostate cancer, for example, who do you think should be advocating a bit harder? Should, should oncologists, GPs, people like myself, urologists, be urging their patients more to undertake the exercise? Or, or do you think it's up to some of the patients to, to advocate for a suitable referral to their, to their treating team? Tom, as you know, I mean, all patients are different in yeah. terms of their background, in terms of how demanding they are. Um, you know, to a certain extent, it's probably a generational thing. Um, you know, a lot of our older patients, they just, you know, the, the physician's always right. Um, you know, the physician owns my medical um, care and information. Um, that's shifting, obviously, market, markedly now. I mean, we, we're trying to get the health consumer, the patient front and centre, uh, the centre of the universe. Um, and uh, so it is probably changing. Um, the, we know from experience that, one of the greatest drivers for a patient changing their lifestyle is their primary care physician saying, hey, do you want to survive this thing? You're going to have to change what you're doing. Um, and uh, you know, we see in terms of the patients that come to our exercise trials and, and volunteer, it's, it's because their oncologist has said, look, this exercise trial is running. I think you'll get some really good advantage out of it. Um, I think, you know, I recommend it. And that's probably the strongest. Uh, the other one would be uh, family. I think as well, um, you know, the, uh, the partner has read or seen a, a webinar like this uh, and go, wow, you need to do some exercise. And, you know, that, that's a strong motivator as well. I say, hey, look, I need you to hang around a bit longer <laughs> uh, to be with me. So I'd say their oncologist or their general practitioner are probably most influential and next would be their, their very close uh, partner or um, close, uh, you know, close family member. Yeah, yeah. The um, we've coming back to exercise and, and how do people monitor it. So we're talking about moderate to vigorous intensity. Are you, do you prefer? Are you more of an RPE rating of perceived exertion type team, or with the resistance stuff, for example, are you going towards repetitions in reserve or, or something completely new? <laughs> No, we use both of those, Tom, um, and extensively. We use RPE um, every single session. And, um, and it's the same with our resistance training. You know, we, we always you know, say, look, you need to have leave two in the tank, uh, so to speak. There's no evidence at all that uh, going further than that has any additional benefit. Um, and there's no reason to do that. Um, so, yeah, that, we use both of those, those methodologies to monitor intensity. Yeah. We also use a lot of wellness checking. So uh, uh, the, when the patient comes in uh, or we send out a, an electronic form for them to do on their phone, um, and it's just a couple of questions about, you know, how tired do you feel today? How well did you sleep? Do you have any uh, uh, pain? And uh, has anything changed in your medical condition since last time we saw you? So we use those wellness checks. And again, that's straight out of elite athlete management. Yeah, yeah. And then you'll modify a session if they've obviously had a terrible night's sleep and death in the family or something like that, for example? Again, straight out of elite athlete management. Um, we use uh, autoregulation. So if the patient comes in and they're feeling pretty sharp, then we, we bump up the intensity. Um, if they're feeling pretty flat, then we, uh, we adjust accordingly. 
Uh, in, it's very rare though when we say, look, you know, do you want to go just go home and rest? In general, if they come in, um, then we say, oh, well, why don't you do one set of leg press and then, you know, go and have a coffee. It's pretty rare that they'll finish up after that. They do the first set and they went, oh, okay, I still feel like crap, but I'll, I might as well finish the exercise and do another couple of sets. And quite often they'll finish the whole workout. Because um, as you know, as soon as you start to exercise, endorphins kick in, pain suppressed, nausea is suppressed, and um, you know, it's, it's just making that start in the session. But we never push them. Um, if they come in and they feel really lousy, then you know, we might just put them on a bike, um, go for a bit of a pedal just so they're doing something. Um, you know, even just put them through a um, um, stretching session or something like that. I think it's I think it's great to hear, like for people listening to this later on. But you know, elite sport can sometimes get a bad rap about all this money that's spent and all these dollars and everything. And particularly at the moment, with, with everything's going on in the current climate, but to hear like how it then transfers through a whole clinical population, I think it's it's, it's an important message that um, it you know sport matters as well because it helps to to guide other management definitely. Oh, absolutely. And without the money in sport, you wouldn't be able to do the research. I mean, only, only in the last, you know, 10 years, I would say, you know, the real money has started to flow through to exercise medicine research. Um, previous to that, the grants were relatively small. Um, but, you know, now you're seeing NH and MRC grants of 500000 a million dollars uh, being awarded for exercise medicine trials. Um, we currently have a trial ongoing, international trial funded by Movember. Uh, for 10 million Australian dollars. And, uh, you know, that's to look at exercises and medicine in men with late stage prostate cancer, with the outcome being, can we actually increase their survival? So uh, prior to that, there just wasn't the investment. But of course, uh, rightly or wrongly, the military in particular, uh, various countries around the world have, have invested billions and billions of dollars in trying to understand how the human responds to physical exercise and um, how to make the warfighter more resilient. Uh, same with the athlete. How do you keep an athlete out on the field um, week after week? You know, how do you patch them up? How do you recover them? So the volume of knowledge around that is quite enormous. And you know, we're only just starting to actually translate that across to patients, um, including cancer patients. And just briefly on a, on a couple of trials you've got going at the moment, the, the interval trial, is that is that the Movember one? That's the Movember trial. So uh, <laughs> the whole range of reasons for that. Um, these, these men have advanced metastatic cancer. So the median survival is about 33 months. And um, what, we, we, what we need now in terms of changing government, in, not changing the government, but changing their, their actual, um, uh, the laws around Medicare in particular, is uh, to get more support for exercise medicine. Because at the moment, as you know, uh, if the patient has cancer, they can go to their GP and get a, um, a general practice management plan. And uh, that gives them up to five sessions with a, an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist or a dietitian, et cetera, uh, which is not a lot. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> it's $68 or $58, I should know that, um, by five. You're talking about an investment per annum of around you know, um, $250, $300. Um, it's not a great commitment uh, to exercise medicine by the federal government. Uh, the only way I'm going to change that is by showing an actual survival advantage because if we can show in this particular study, we're trying to demonstrate that targeted exercise will produce the same survival advantage as the top drugs at the moment, which is these super antiandrogens. Um, if we can demonstrate that, then patients will demand exercise medicine and clinicians will require it. And it's only then, I think, that we'll actually see that uh, governments around the world will put more uh, of taxpayer money uh, into support exercise as a medicine. And you've also got an active surveillance trial as well? Yeah, so that's the absolute opposite end uh, of the spectrum. So we've got one in, in prostate cancer patients who are now palliative, end stage of life. Uh, but at the other end, what we're looking at is men who've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, but it's very low grade. And the issue is that in the past, bang, uh, they would have been recommended for surgery or they would have been put on um, androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, and like my dad, they would have had a whole lot, of, whole lot of side effects of that. And like my dad, two years later, they would have died of something else, um, most likely cardiovascular disease. 
And so uh, we've learned from that. And, and uh, you know, in a man which hasn't got an aggressive prostate cancer, it's probably best to leave them alone and just wait and see. But that's difficult for the, for the patient. You know, the patient goes, oh, what, what are you going to do? Nothing. It's, no, no, no. We're going to, you know, we're going to regularly see you and we're going to monitor it. It's called active surveillance and we'll see how it goes. Um, it doesn't pass the pub test. You know, the guy goes down to the pub and they say, oh, you know, how are you going? He said, oh, I'm not too good. I've got prostate cancer. And, oh, geez, mate. What are you doing about it? Nothing. His mates go, okay. <laughs> Interesting approach. So what we're doing, though, is trying to improve their, um, their decision satisfaction in, in going with active surveillance uh, for a whole range of reasons. There's a very nice study done in the US in men in similar situations. And what they did, fairly heavy intervention combining exercise, meditation, mindfulness, and a vegan diet. And what they showed was they, they uh, re, uh, pretty, pretty much stopped the progression of the disease in its tracks. They reversed a lot of the markers of the prostate cancer progression. So it could be a lot of the prostate cancer uh, low grade that by uh, using exercise medicines and dietary changes, getting control of your stress, body fat, etc., cetera, uh, you may be able to slow the disease to the point that um, it's, it's not going to be a problem for you uh, and you can just leave it alone. It also passes the pub test because when the guy goes down and says, oh, I've got prostate cancer, his mate says, what are you doing about it? He says, oh, I'm taking exercise medicine. Oh, okay, that sounds good. Bang, you, 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 know, you have a beer and you move on. So that's the basis of, the, of, that, of, of that study. Yeah, cool. That's, it's, it's great. Like, it's just it's hitting all the boxes. <laughs> yeah, I like the pub test. You know, hopefully, and then hopefully his mate who's got cardiovascular disease goes, this exercise medicine thing sounds good. Maybe I should talk to my GP about it. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Rob, we know uh, clinically, you know, sometimes it is really hard to sell exercise. And so you meet someone who's been living under a rock, have never heard of exercise being a medicine. How would you sell it to them? Oh. Look, I, the same way in which I sell it, I guess, to the patients and, and, and I guess more so to the clinicians. I mean, clinicians well understand the mechanisms of uh, exogenous drugs. You know, they, they understand the action of um, cholesterol lowering drugs and, uh, and they prescribe them and they're effective. And uh, the, way I, the way I describe it is that uh, exercise just switches on the body's internal drug factory. It's in your internal pharmacy. Uh, because uh, when we exercise, our, our internal biochemistry shifts, shifts markedly. Um, it, uh, it acts to um, help you overcome the, the decline due to cardiovascular disease. Um, it stops bone loss, it stops muscle loss, you know. Uh, and, and these are basically chemical. Um, so you are producing endogenous or within drugs. Uh, so exercise is a medicine. I, look, I, I was in a, a meeting uh, the other day, um, a teleconference, and it was a, you know, a fairly high level meeting talking about funding for for grants in, um, in neurological conditions. And, you know, and one of the physicians there was just out of, he said, no, exercise is not a, not a medicine. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a side thing. He said, look, it's very important. I think it's fantastic, but it's not a medicine. And, uh, you know, we, we talk about so many other therapeutics, which actually we call medicine uh, because they, they, they produce actual chemical changes or physical changes, structural changes within the body. Exercise is no different to that. It produces, in some instances, much larger positive benefits in terms of the internal biochemistry than many of our top drugs. That's, uh, that's great. That's great, Rob. I've just actually we've got one question that came through uh, on the line. So many trainers apply, simply apply generic solutions. What efforts are being done to help educate non-medical fitness trainers? So I suppose your, your PTs rather than your exercise physiologists. My passionate belief in, um, within Australia, but also it, it's, it's front of mind in many other countries, Canada, the US, um, certainly in the UK, is that if we're going to get any handle on the chronic disease avalanche, which is falling on us, um, we have to utilise the enormous capacity of the uh, fitness industry. And th th simply, we cannot rely on in-hospital or allied health care for, for the millions and millions of people that
that uh, have rapidly advanced in chronic disease. I mean, we, ha we have a rapidly aging population, uh, rapidly increasing rate of chronic disease because of poor lifestyle, disease we don't have to have. Uh, certainly physical activity is a major factor in turning this around. Uh, the only way we're going to achieve that is to pull on as many resources as we possibly can. And one of those is to actually uh, utilise the fitness industry in terms of uh, not only the, um, the actual infrastructure, but also the huge capacity around expertise. I mean, obviously fitness professionals are very trained around motivating um, people, but also in, in, in uh, monitoring their exercise. Um, and so we, we have to actually utilise that. We do, I agree, need training. Look, you know, obviously, uh, you know, ECU's got a, one of the largest um, exercise physiology courses in the country. And, uh, you know, I, I teach all of the exercise oncology components and, you know, it's, it's two lectures and, and one lab in a four-year degree. So even EPs coming out do not get enough um, oncology training as well. So um, we've, at ECU, we've introduced a uh, graduate certificate, graduate diploma and a master's specifically in exercise oncology for that reason. So we've, we've got to upskill our exercise physiologists as well uh, to work with cancer patients. So still many I talk to are really uncomfortable and um, they, they, they fear they lack the understanding uh, and skills to work with this patient population, particularly those with advanced disease. Um, the same with physiotherapy. We have to, we have to in, uh, increase and upskill them so that they are more comfortable working with these populations. And again, I, I agree with the person who's called in. We do have to upskill those that are interested, uh, those fitness professionals, personal trainers, uh, fitness instructors, so that they can actually work with these cancer patients in their, um, in their facility. Thanks, Rob. Now, that's not for everyone. You know, if you have a, it, it's all about setting and an individual patient. You know, I, I, I don't think we're, you know, we can't get to the point where a, a patient with advanced metastatic cancer can be going down to their local gym, training by themselves, or, you know, uh, you know having a, a, you know, a personal trainer actually supervising them. And it's not, it's nothing about the profession, or anything like that. It's just the wrong environment. It's the, it's the wrong setting. That sort of patient probably needs to be in a hospital or a cancer centre. Um, in an exercise, you know, a, a, an exercise clinic, which is, you know, close to medical care and emergency support if required. Uh, having said that, we have had over the last uh, 16 years, uh, approximately 250,000 um, patient contacts. Uh, during that time, we've only had four serious adverse events and no fatalities. So the, a key message is under proper supervision in the right environment, with the proper safety in, uh, in place, your risk of having a serious adverse event under exercise, regardless of whether you have an advanced chronic disease, is very, very low. That's a, uh, that's a great, great little message there, Rob. I'll, um, I'll let you go. I just, my final, Thanks, Tom. final thought before today was the thing that I suppose I love so much about the research you guys do over there, particularly around exercise, is it's, it's, it's all, it all gives patients hope. Like that, you diagnose with cancer and you kind of dictate it to a lot of pathways for a while. And then, you know, often people say, well, what can I do? Because they feel like they're just being spoken to and talked to. Whereas all of this evidence now, you know, you give that person hope that if they go and exercise, and yes, there's, there might be some barriers, but they're just about always work throughable. And you can yeah. get moving and they, they feel so much more hopeful and thankful for exercising. Yeah, absolutely. I think what is a common theme with a person with cancer is that loss of control. Uh, they're getting things put into them. They're getting things taken out of them. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, the, the issues around finances, around, you know, work, family, everything else. Many of our patients see the exercise as something they can actually do and actually have control over. And that's very important for their physical health, but also uh, for their mental health. And and COVID-19 introduced a whole series of challenges because our patients could no longer come into our clinics. And, uh, you know, they reported that they were alone, scared. They were reporting that their physical and mental health was declining because they, they couldn't exercise. They couldn't come in and uh, exercise with their peers. And uh, we certainly had to get our skates on and, and ramp up our telehealth very, very quickly. And uh, within a couple of weeks, we were able to uh, roll the exercise prescriptions out uh, to the patients on their smart device or computer. Um, and we, we draw obviously extensively on um, video chat as well to supervise them. 
uh, also. And that was right across all of our trials, but also our admitted patients as well. You do notice that um, the, you know, the exercise has enormous psychological uh, benefits uh, for the patient well beyond, beyond the physical as well. And uh, you know, that's a good point is that the fact that they, it is something that they, they can manage and, and, and control, but also it's that mixing in with other people. Um, and we've seen that they can mix in virtually as well. I mean, we have uh, virtual exercise sessions set up where they're still exercising with their friends and mates that they did when they were in clinic, um, but they're doing it in a, in a video chat format. That's, uh, that's great to hear. And it's, it's always, yeah, COVID threw around plenty of challenges, but there's always a workaround. <laughs> so that's yeah. Cool. All right, Rob. Thank you so, so much. Oh, pleasure. Me. Thanks for your time. Um, can't thank you enough for joining us today. Happy Men's Health Week. And uh, we'll catch up with you if you're ever back over in Brisbane once the borders open. Absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Thanks so much, Tom. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Rob. See Thank ya. You. Bye.